ご講演をいただきますのは基礎科学部門で受賞されました。In the category of basic sciences, this year's laureate is Dr. Masatoshi Nei. Dr. Nei, please. Prior to having his lecture, let's introduce to you the profile of Dr. Ney. Could you please look at the screen? Dr. Masatoshi Ney was born in 1931 in Miyazaki City, Miyazaki Prefecture in Japan. He was a second child of seven for his family. This picture was taken when Doctor was second grade at elementary school. Far left of the fourth horizontal row is Dr. Ney. He often played around with friends by fishing or bird trapping, but he excelled in most subjects and received a certificate of excellence at the end of each year. His father was a Hard workers didn't mind any difficulty and endeavored his strenuous efforts, and he wanted Dr. Ney to be a farmer as well. His mother took very good care of him because he was expected to inherit his father's farm. This is the picture when Dr. Ney was a high school student. Arrow shows Dr. Ney. In the next year after the war, when he was 15, he got accident of explosion of ignition equipment of wartime bomb. He lost the vision of his left eye. This event caused him to reduce physical activities, but it stimulated his interest in reading of various books and led him to become a scientist. Doctor graduated the Agriculture Department of Miyazaki University, and he proceeded to graduate school of Kyoto University. While studying at the Kyoto University, the mathematically inclined Dr. Ney was strongly drawn to population genetics, a research field that relies heavily on mathematical techniques. It was this encounter that led him to break new ground in evolutionary biology. In 1969, Dr. moved his research base to United States of America, and in 1972, he presented the paper of Ney's genetic distance. This was the analysis based on the statistical method to measure genetic difference in biological populations and species. It allows to estimate how long ago different biological populations branched off from the common ancestors. Doctor utilized this and concluded that early Africans and other groups diverged from the, our common human ancestors about 115,000 years ago, and that the latter then branched again to form Asian and European populations about 55,000 years ago. This provided an important clue to reinforce the theory that our human ancestors originated on the African continent and then spread around the globe. Further, from the molecular levels of data, his group developed the neighbor joining the method for constructing the molecular evolutionary phylogenetic trees. This method has since been used extensively by many researchers, not only in evolutionary biology, but also in conservation biology and ecology. Dr. Ney, still today, is a professor at Pennsylvania State University in the United States. He is teaching the young researchers and jointly continue to elucidate the mystery of evolutionary process. Doctors gave the advice to younger people 
It's important to question any dogma and develop new interpretation of any scientific findings, use a ton of common sense. This is Dr. Ney's family, with his sons and daughters' families together. Dr. recalls his nine years stay in Kyoto when he was learning at the Kyoto University. He says, Kyoto is an old city, but it has generated new spirits. Today, Dr. Ney is going to give us his review of his own life and reporting to us what was his way walking through as a researcher and the results of the research. And the title says Theory and Reality of Evolutionary Biology. Now, Dr. Ney, please. It is my great honor to be able to receive the wonderful prize of Kyoto Prize with high authority. I feel privileged and I feel humbled indeed. Today, I've given the good opportunity to review my own life, what kind of research I have done. I would like to go through it with you. First of all, let me talk about my childhood and what was the university education. Let me start. I was born in a very prosperous family of liquor-making business in a small village of Miyazaki Prefecture of Japan called Nakamura, 15 kilometers from Miyazaki City. That was the countryside. Liquor in that area is called shochu. So shochu making a business was my family business. It used to be the prosperous at one time. However, Great Depression started in the United States. That wave also reached Japan. And we got depression in Japan. So our family went bankrupt for liquor making a business. Because my grandfather use the credit system for selling the shochu or liquor to many clients. And in the Great Depression, collection of payment was not successfully done. Therefore, in the chain reaction, our family business went bankrupt. I don't know the details, but that was told from my parents. So that was the time of my grandfather. My grandfather was running the business of liquor making and then went bankrupt. Then my father had just a little bit of area of land and my father started farming. And my father and the mother, both of them are hard, were hard workers. In several years after the bankruptcy, they have retained much of the land which was sold during the Depression. In fact, I had one brother and six sisters. And actually, I was the second child. 
I had the younger brother. However, at three years old, he died because of dysentery, because we didn't have the antibiotics. Therefore, he suffered and died. Therefore, I was the eldest son, and I was, in a way, destined, usually, to succeed the family land. Therefore, my father tried to make me to become farmer as well, and my mother took very good care of me, maybe too much good care of me, because I was the only son, and I was expected to inherit the family. So those were the memories of the childhood. Having said that, bankruptcy was a bankruptcy. However, in the countryside, we didn't have so much of problems because there are lots of fools available to us. We went fishing in the, the river, or we had a lot of fun with friends, bird trapping, or making toys with twigs and so on. I enjoyed my life. I I don't recall so much of the difficulties in life. And then I reached the age to enter the elementary school. In my days of elementary school, perhaps I was not blessed with the affluence. Surely not. However, in those days, the nationally censored textbook was used in the classrooms. I studied very well at school. However, at home, my father and mother didn't give me any other journals or supplementary textbooks because they didn't expect me to be a scholar. So therefore, I was purely grown only with the censored textbook by national government of Japan in those days. But I was good at academic subjects, always received the certificate of excellence in each year. Therefore, I was enjoying learning, but my father didn't give me the training to study harder. However, I was not a bad student at school. And then Japan-China war broke up. Now, even today, many Japanese may not have the good idea. Japan-China war was the name for the Japanese army's invasion into China. That started the war. And then many men were drafted, including my own uncle. He was drafted, mobilized to China, and died in the war. And then gradually the war got much more fierce stage and that expanded to the World War II finally. That was 1941. Then the school education has the much more stronger color of the military color. You should live for country. You should dedicate your lives for the sake of the eternity of country of Japan. In those days, well, I would like to show you the picture with my father when I was a very small kid. But at the time of the World War II, this picture was already shown, though. You might be able to notice all the students have barefoot, no shoes. Why? What was the reason? Well, during the wartime, we had a shortage of labor. Therefore, Nobody was able to get shoes. Shoes were not allowed. Well, only exception was for winter. Well, Miyazaki is located in the southern part of Japan, so therefore it's warmer. But on the 
Bully Road, when I walked on the gravels, the stones, I still remember the pain on the soul. Now, let me move on to 1945. Most of the Japanese cities were bombed and burned, including the city of Miyazaki. I was living in the village 15 kilometers away of Miyazaki city, so I had to watch the flare of fire after the bomb. I well remember those. But unexpectedly, that bomb attack just happened in our village. It was a mystery why bombing was given to the rural countryside. Well, in retrospect, Miyazaki was located at the shallow shelf of the seabed. That means that that was the right good target for American force to land into Japan. So therefore, that was reported to be the first target. In Iwo Island, you may have heard the fortress built by the Japanese army. The same site of fortress was being constructed in the village. So therefore, people had a hard time during the wartime. But on August the 15th, 1945, World War II suddenly ended with the declaration of the defeat by Japanese emperor. Well, many Japanese were shocked, but I felt somewhat relieved because if this war lasted one more month, probably I wouldn't have been here. Probably I would have been dead because I was living in the targeted area by the US force. So I was lucky because it saved my life. When I was an early child, I had full of curiosity. And when I was at elementary school, I think that was the higher grades. I wanted to know the mechanism of the clock on the wall. I deassembled. However, not managed to reassemble. So I was heavily scolded by my parents. And also, in the barn, there was a rope making machine. I found that machine. And what's the mechanism of making rope in the excellent way? I was investigating that machine and then all of a sudden, my pointing finger was cut with that machine. And four or five years, I suffered from the serious scar. But the largest accident was the explosion of an ignition equipment for a wartime bomb that attacked my left eye. I think that was the ignition part for the wartime bomb. However, I didn't know what it was. So therefore, I just picked up the piece of the metal, and I tried to use plier to open it. And then all of a sudden, it exploded in my hands. Not large explosion, but I got the injury onto my face when I 
noticed the metal piece stuck into the pupils of my left eye. So I got lost the left eye sight. My father was upset and took me to the city of Miyazaki, the visiting the eye clinic, and then he said, well, well, your son should stay for one month at my clinic, and then it will be cured. And we believed it. And I stayed there for about a month, but in the end, it was not cured. So I don't have any sight on my left eye. In many senses, that gave me various types of influence. When we lose sight on one eye, then we cannot get the measurement of distance, so we cannot enjoy any more with the friends for sports, tennis or baseball, whatever. We cannot get the sense of the distance. So that was the negative thing, but we got the positive, I've got the positive effect. That accident was in around the time of 1946, when I was 15 years old. And little by little, because of after war, new books were started to be published. My parents purchased those, and then at the clinic, I read the book. With only one eye, we still can read books. And then I read and read many books. And then my interest in the academic matter got risen in my heart. Anyway, what? I want to return to the previous one. It seems to me that uh, I'm always pursuing the theory and not practical. I'm sorry. Oh, it's not returning to the original state, sorry. What? Oh, I see. I should say next slide. And then I, not, not like next slide, the previous slide. That's the one that I want to get. One more. Ah, yes, yes, thank you. So after this explosion accident, this stimulated my academic activity. And during the wartime, most of their classes in the junior or high school was closed, and then we were mobilized to the factory for the military goods or in the farming area. Many husbands are drafted, so therefore we were mobilized to help those women. So therefore we didn't have any opportunity to study at all. But after getting the injury, I thought that I should study because I lost my eyesight. And also I had one cousin and uh, that cousin was much senior to me, have left many books before the war, and I read those. And then the older textbooks in junior high or high school, then I noticed that, uh, well, because of the vacuum of the education in the wartime, I realized that uh, I have two shortage of knowledge. So I borrowed those many books from my cousin. My cousin was drafted, and now at, the, at that time he was in Siberia. Well, next slide, please. Anyway, that's the triggering event, and I started to study rather seriously. And in 1948, there was the Miyazaki Oyodo High School was established according to the new education system. 
Now, I reduced the sleeping hours because I wanted to learn, and then my academic score was substantially elevated. I was regarded as the brightest student. I was number one in the classroom at that high school. And then there was a test to measure the appropriateness, that is the ATC version of Japan. Then in the Miyazaki prefecture, I was in top 10. So therefore, I was a very good student in terms of academic score. So still, my father did not want me to send to the college. So two high school teachers visited my house and persuaded, convinced his father. Your son is very clever. Your son should go to university. But my father wanted to keep me as a farmer. However, the teachers, two earnest teachers, persuaded my father. But one condition given from the father. So you should go to the Miyazaki University, not the Tokyo or Kyoto, uh, because we, I can commute from my house, not costly. So that was one condition given from my father. Now, new education system was introduced into Japan after the war. So liberal arts are two years at the university. So that was specified program or curriculum for the university. It was good because German language and uh, English, Japanese, no, Japanese was not, because that was in Japan. Chemistry, mathematics, laws, Many things in liberal arts included. And then uh, I got the various kinds of interest, but especially mathematics and the physics were the good subjects I liked during the high school. But at the university, I was impressed that the quantum chemistry, just a brief fundamental level was educated, but I got greatly interested. But most influential study subject was biology. Mendelian laws of inheritance and Thomas Morgan chromosome theory was announced. Those were requiring the mathematics for the theoretical tools. And I went to the libraries quite often. I investigated many of the things, and JBS Holden, or just all right, or Fisher, all those papers were found. And I loved mathematics from the beginning, therefore, I learned in my own way for the population type of genetics. And I decided to measure genetics. And for population genetics, I wrote the paper in English and submitted to the journal in Japan. In retrospect today, it doesn't have so much of the originality. I admit, but the will or wish was generated, I can see. And I wanted to make the population genetics useful for the reality or for the people. Therefore, probably plant breeding or for those area I could contribute to the society. So therefore, now quantitative characters was the next research theme for my own experimental studies of the population genetics. All the method was used, but Kenneth Mother published a book in those days. And I was amazed to see his method, and I used that method, and also further developed the theory was made, and at the Kyoto University, taking three or four years, because I got the assistants together with me, so we wrote the paper. 
However, after writing uh, the paper, I was not satisfied somehow. Population generates of quantitative characters that certainly influenced by environment. Therefore, in order to investigate the evolutionary process, we have to catch genes. So that's the clear message given to me. That was a good lesson. And for the later part of my life, well, let me move on to the next slide. Well, this is the picture taken recently, sorry. Not so much different in terms of look from outside. Next, please. So first, I wrote the paper for the population genetics of quantitative characters. I got degree and I got the position. And I was appointed as assistant professor in the laboratory of a plant breeding. In those days, there was an invitation to the United States because the Rockefeller Foundation studied the fellowship. Very good fellowship had started. So we can choose many a, options of American University and uh, make in one university as a research base, and uh, we can work in many other universities. Therefore, I first went abroad to the University of California at the Davis. And there was a Professor Robert Allard, and Professor Allard did a lot of research for the statistical approach. However, when I went there, their approach or level was not so much different at the time of the Kyoto University. Therefore, I moved to the North Carolina. There were many people who are challenging the new things. And one was my old friend, Therefore, so that friend invited me to North Carolina, so that I moved. Next slide, please. At Rockefeller Fellowship, great help was given from Professor Kimura, the left. We had a good acquaintanceship and Professor Kimura helped me to go to the United States to study abroad. This is my friend, Mr. Kenichi Kojima, at North Carolina State University, and his friend, Ms. Teresa Keller. Mr. Kojima was already associate professor there, so he was promoted much higher speed. Then I came back to Kyoto University and I wondered what next should I do because American ways and Japanese ways are quite different. Well, in America, pioneering spirit is very much cherished and regarded as an important thing for doing research in any of the research allowed. Even in the applied science department, they were able to do the basic research. For example, at the Colonel University for Plant Breeding Laboratory, they produced two Nobel Prize laureates. Like these examples, pioneering spirit was prioritized. And that's what we need to do in our research in this field. And so I well, I decided to go back to the United States later, about in 1963 I married, and in 1967 I published a bit interesting paper. 
From the Kyoto University, I moved to the National Institute of Radiological Science in Japan, so I did the research on this. So this explains the content of that paper. There are many genes. In between genes, interaction is the fact that with the interaction stronger, then they get together stronger. So if we miss those, they will be scattered around. In those days, we didn't have this kind of data at all, so many people had doubt, or so I was worried about whether many other people could believe this. But after publishing this paper, a lot of data published, so hox genes, that means the determining the body, we were analyzed into this sequence and MHC cluster genes. It's related to the immune system. Those genes were reported and with the strong link or interaction, those are well preserved. And next shows the different kinds. That means that less interaction for this example of the smell receptor genes, olfactory function receptors. Interaction is very weak for those kind of genes that will be scattered over all the chromosome, not linked strongly together. Therefore, my theory in my published paper was verified to be correct. I came back from the United States and moved to the National Institute of Radiological Science. And in 1969, I published another paper to Nature. That paper predicted the presence of many duplicate genes and pseudogenes in vertebrates. Pseudogenes mean that the sort of the genes which has dead function or loss of function. In those days, intron, exon, those were not elucidated yet. And the structure of the genes were total mystery. Therefore, even though I wrote this kind of paper, not much of the attention was paid. Next, please. So this is the paper that I wrote in 1969, dated at the top. In vertebra, there are much of the duplication of gene and also pseudogene. So that's the message of this paper. But that was not well accepted. Next slide, please. However, just recently, many, many duplicated genes were found, and also pseudogenes are as many as in numbers of the functional genes in the genome. So what I predicted is verified to be correct, but probably too early, I wonder. Not so much of attention was given to my finding. And then from the United States, a lot of molecular data was published. So therefore, I thought that it would be better to go to the United States to do my own research. Therefore, now I went to the Brown University first. There was a person who recognized my significance of my work. So therefore, with tenure, I went to Brown University to be the position to be paid. And now, the research fund 
was available, but we have to make a research group to do the research. That's the way to do the research. Usually that's difficult, but fortunately, when immediately after uh, visiting the Brown University, I got two research grants together with the faculty members or the postdoc or the students or undergraduates, and then they got together with me. So I think that we all managed the good way. So within two years, I was promoted to be the full professor at Brown University. However, uh, Dr. Jack Shao, well, he was doing the research, what was it planning to go to the Texas, and then he wanted to establish the center for the population genetics. Uh, he told me to come with me, come with me. So therefore, that condition was very good, not so much of the teaching job. That means that the only education required to the graduate school students. So that means that as a researcher, uh, we can have the plenty of time and good fund for the research. So I decided to move to Texas, Houston. And I stayed there for 17 years. Then I generated many different ideas. So those years were my active years. But in 1990, now Penn State University, uh, Dr. Bob Allard, who was a friend, said to me, Dr. Ney, now molecular evolution genetics institute will be established, so please come to be a director for that research institute. So therefore, I moved to Pennsylvania. So those were the events in my life. So even in the United States, I moved around. Next slide, please. What I did in those days are interrelated in retrospect. So let me give you in summing up of all related those. What I have done in the United States is the molecular evolution. That's one aspect of my research achievements. In 1972, I published the original paper of a genetic distance. That means the paper published in 71 was revised, but this 72 version is usually called genetic distance of the nays distance. Of course, there were various kinds of distance. However, when we try to combine with the evolution, it did not work away, usually looking at the geometrical aspect and so But I made my own genetic distance. And related to that, I made the sampling errors, determination, and so on. But I think with this paper, I think this was the first paper with which I attracted attention from other researchers and invested DNA and so on. But in those days, neutral theory was published by Professor Kimura and debate in the scientific field took place because in the United States, the scientists for the evolution used a morphological phenotype like a molecular evolution, morphology is different, not related to time. So that was the debate in those days. And I read many accounts of the Magorias paper read. Therefore, I knew the element of the molecular 
evolution. Therefore, I supported this neutral explanation of the protein polymorphism. And anyway, we have to prove with data. Just building up the theory, nobody will listen to. In biology, we should collect data and show to be verified. So that's the belief that I adhere to. And I wrote a paper on the numbers of a synonymous and non-synonymous nucleotide substitution. That means the nucleotide not changing the form of the protein, while the other one is making the change of the protein, so synonymous and non-synonymous. And I calculated the probability of those. Then later, this paper became quite often cited by many researchers because natural selection can be well explained by this theory. Now, I also studied the human evolution in 1974 as written here. What I did here was related to the human beings, Caucasian, Orientals, or Europeans. So those are the mainly speaking three major races. So what's the difference? So that's what I investigated. Next, please. Well, before touching upon the human beings, this was the research done for the polymorphism of gene, whether that's neutral or not. So that was tested. Arrow frequencies were researched, and the neutrality is supported. Next, please. The genetic distance that I have uh, talked about is uh, proportionate to the change in the amino acid. Therefore, if you can find out the rate of amino acid uh, changes, you're able to uh, calculate the timing. So proteins and blood group uh, data had been looked at and analyzed, comparing uh, the Europeans, uh, uh, Orientals, and uh, Africans, and the time of divergence uh, was uh, 115,000 years ago and 55,000 years ago. A very broad analysis, or rough analysis, but I think uh, this may be true, more or less. But we analyzed other populations after this. And and uh, we came to the out of Africa theory of human origins, which went northward and to Europe and also uh, to Asia, Southeast Asia, North America, South America, uh, in that order. So this is the out of Africa theory of human origins. How much time do I have now? How much more do I have? So I took interest in uh, molecular phylogenetics. In 1972, I came up with the uh, phylogenic uh, genetic tree of uh, Drosophila utilizing a method called the UPGMA, but this was not successful. So Walter Fitch I was using the least squares method or the minimum evolution method, and therefore, 
I looked at that, but it was more complex than I thought, and therefore I wanted to simplify, simplify those methods. In addition to that, uh, uh, the predecessors uh, were fighting uh, with the Cladists were fighting with the phonetics. I was much criticized, but at the same time, Naria Saito and I came up with the so-called neighbor joining a method. Whereby we satisfy both the least squares criterion and the minimum evolution criterion at each step of the tree construction. In this way, we were successful, and this has been cited more than 34,000 times. And we also worked on mega. It would be too time consuming uh, to do everything by hand, and therefore we decided to uh, rely on a computer program. There were two major computer programs available at that time, but they were not so useful. And therefore, we wanted to have something that uh, makes the calculation much easier and uh, I'll be able to calculate the distance and uh, to uh, construct the tree. We wanted to make uh, things more simple. Therefore, Sudhya Kuma, who was a student at that time and postdoc fellow, Koichiro Tamura, and I decided to come up with a new computer program package, which was as you see in the next slide, completed. Using the neighbor joining method, uh, humans, chimpanzee, gorilla, orang, orangutan, all of these uh, relationships that can be uh, identified. And the final product, the mega, was released. This was the first version. Made uh, basically based on my idea, I wrote up uh, the uh, text and uh, thought about uh, what to put in. But the program actually it was uh, made by Sudhir Kumar and Koichiro Tamura which is cited uh, very frequently nowadays. Next slide, please. From that time period, uh, I uh, became interested in why phenotypic evolution takes place. The not interested in the height of the phenotypes, uh, but uh, I was uh, more interested in uh, the genes. Therefore, I looked at various genes. For example, olfactory receptor genes, histone, uh, histone genes, ubiquitin genes, and as you see in the next slide, there were things happening uh, different from what used to be said. The evolution, first of all, starts with divergent evolution. Where the species uh, divide into two. But uh, next, uh, we have come to know of concerted evolution. In other words, one species would uh, have offsprings and uh, con there would be natural selection. 
more or less under this concept. But there was also something called birth and death evolution, which used, seems to be most reasonably fitting the model. And therefore, genes would die often. And the new genes that would be created by duplication. And that is uh, uh, the process of evolution, as we found out. Next slide, please. Not everything is neutral. In certain genetic uh, loci, there was over-dominant selection. According to our finding, Nick Marika, next slide. I have uh, written this paper together with Austin Hughes, carried in Nature, and MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex, is uh, very polymorphic, and uh, there may be 102 or 200 alleles. And uh, there was much discussion as to why. Discussion went on for 30 years or so. When, I, when we wrote this paper, the conclusion was that there probably was overdominance. Others worked on various other organisms, and they more or less came to the same conclusion as us. So, based on that, we further went on to work on the chemosensory receptors. A postdoc fellow, Nozawa and Nimura, worked with me on this research. OR is olfactory receptor, but uh, in parentheses is the pseudogenes. So the numbers of functional genes and also in parentheses the pseudogenes. So many genes have died, but they still are left in the population. So they don't have to be, they don't have to disappear. There is a pheromone and taste, immunoglobulin. Once again, uh, the same can be said of the number of functional genes and pseudogenes. There seems to be much flexibility. Please go to the next slide. We have platypus, opossum, cow, dog, mouse. Uh, looking at the number of genes and uh, how many genes the ancestors had. So if you trace back, uh, you are able to see that the numbers change dramatically. So we, don't, we shouldn't think in a fixed way. We should think more flexibly, as we can learn from this. So, next, regarding the theory of mutation-driven evolution is the next, top next topic. Uh, we uh, decided to find out that mutation had a very important role to play. Darwinian, Darwinian evolution uh, said that natural selection was important, and uh, uh, mutation was only of secondary importance. But I said, no, it's the other way around. Natural selection is secondary, and mutation is primary. And I have written a book. Next slide, please. 
I published the book this year. It is quite different from what you read in textbooks on this topic uh, that you find in the United States usually. So I'm looking forward to much criticism coming uh, uh, for my book. But uh, we haven't had so many book reviews so far, so the uh, harsh criticisms are bound to come from now on, I'm sure. But I don't care what people think. I still think that this is true. Next slide, please. This shows that uh, there are various organisms uh, on Earth. There are plants, animals, snails, fungus, all sorts of things. It all started with one protoorganism, which evolved, which was that what Charles Darwin said. So that's his great achievement. He said that all sorts of organisms has evolved from one protoorganism. It was they were not made by God. It's easy to say that things were made, living organisms were made by God, because you don't need to explain things when that was the answer. But if I think if people uh, tend to say that the natural selection caused all this, but people tend to say that uh, uh, just following Charles Darwin without having gone through their own research. Of course, it's easy to say that things occurred based on natural selection uh, because you once again don't need any explanation. The answer is that natural selection caused all this. But that's not biology. Whether it's natural selection or mutation, the snail, for instance, and the bat, why would they look so different from each other? You need to explain that why part. Biology even today is not successful in explaining this difference. Next slide. This is a human eye and uh, the eye of the uh, Drosophila. Walter Gehring identified that uh, in both cases uh, uh, the important role is played by Pax6 gene. So the origin uh, was uh, the same, but the morphology the shape of the human eye and the eye of the Drosophila are so different from each other. We don't know why. No explanation so far. So evolution, the next slide, please, is full of enigma. And in order to elucidate the why part, you just can't say that it was all a result of natural selection. You need to explain the process. Why mutation occurred, why natural selection uh, occurred, why nucleotide substitution occurred with new mutation, etc., etc. Uh, many, many things that need to be explained. That's what I'm saying. I don't mean to boast, but my papers, fortunately, have been cited by many people. When I made this uh, copy, there were 182,000 citations altogether. The neighbor joining method uh, leads with uh, 34,000 citations. Also, MEGA 
program uh, has become more popular in citation. But other than that, molecular evolutionary genetics, the book has also been cited the, it's quite rare that uh, citations in this order would take place for a book. So perhaps uh, I have surpassed uh, Charles Darwin in terms of numbers of citations, but of course, uh, not many people cite Charles Darwin anyway because uh, we all know what he did. So Charles Darwin uh, probably uh, it has uh, made a much, much greater achievements compared with myself, I'm sure. I have been working on many different things. And uh, that was possible only of, because I had these uh, collaborators of graduate students, postdoctoral scholars and senior collaborators. Close to 70 people work together with me as collaborators. These people allowed me to do what I did. I am very grateful. One advantage of being in the United States is that uh, many people come from different uh, uh, countries, not only Americans, but Australian, uh, Swedish people, Finnish people, Japanese, Chinese. People come from different countries. Um, many excellent researchers gather in the United States, which is a benefit of uh, being in the United States. This slide was taken at the party. As you can see here, we have uh, Australian, uh, Russian, American, Chinese, Japanese, many nationalities are represented uh, here. Indeed, they have uh, been great collaborators in my research. I am indeed so grateful to everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. In order to express appreciation, a bouquet of flowers will be presented to Dr. Nei. Dr. Ney, thank you very much.